Hey folks, welcome to another great interview from The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. This time I talked to Vibia Natana from the local group Black in Sask. We talk about the organization and some of the things they're doing, as well as racism in Canada, the US, and more specifically, Saskatchewan. I want to mention briefly that I do talk a little bit about people I either work with or have worked with in the past. And it isn't my intention to call them out or to alienate them in any way, uh, but to simply point out that sometimes the language that is used in these majority white work workplaces can be really shitty, even if nobody is calling it out. I'm go not going to make excuses for people who denigrate black folks, indigenous folks, or members of any other marginalized group. I do, however, however live among and work with people who say shitty things on a regular basis. Uh, I ha And I have to have a decent relationship with them. And I do believe also that given the right opportunity, most people will see the error of their ways and change their behavior. It isn't the duty of marginalized people to educate white dudes. It's my job. And I just have to find the right ways to do it for each individual that I meet. So now that I have that caveat out of the way, I want to say thank you to all my patrons, including newish patrons, Jamie Humboldt and Occulte Veritatis. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and also I need to give an extra big thanks to Jamie for the extra donation on Buy Me a Coffee. And of course, a heartfelt thank you to everyone who listens or watches. Um, please make sure to share the show with your friends or family who may be interested in the perspective of an anarchist who also happens to be a laborer in a conservative province. If you want to become a patron, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send me a one-time donation at uh, buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't support my work financially, then a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites would be great. That's everything I've got to say before the show. Here you go. <laughs> All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Vibia from Black in Sask. Hi. Thanks nice. for joining me. <laughs> well, it's, great. it's great to be here. I think that um, this week, or maybe even just in the last couple of hours, I've been like, what day of the week is it? But it is. <laughs> I knew that we were having today's discussion, <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, that's fair. I think time doesn't really mean things the same thing it used to mean <laughs> like two years ago. Yeah. Like, I mean, well, there's also like the week of like the holidays and winter holidays and everything. And then also you factor in the pandemic and yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess a good place to start uh, is kind of a little bit maybe about yourself and a little bit about Black and Sask. For sure. Yeah. Um. So maybe I'll start with Black and Sask. Um, so the organization itself um, was founded um, in 2020. Um, so in 2020, a lot happened. I think that's fair to say on, on every level, but especially yeah. when it comes to um, looking at issues of social justice. And I think we saw very much so in 2020, especially um, in the spring and summer, um, in mainstream media anyways, um, that there was definitely a lot of um, prominence of a lot of the social justice issues that were happening in the US, um, racial tensions and such, and a lot of the different tragedies that were happening just back to back on like constant media reel at that time were really front of mind for a lot of people. And interestingly enough, but I mean, not, not surprising for many people in the black community, um, these conversations have been happening for time memorial, you know, like we've, we've been talking about these issues, right? And I think um, for the founding uh, members of Black and Sask, um, prior to the actual formation of our, or our organization, um, a lot of us actually didn't, well, not a lot, but like, I should say some of us weren't actually really close. We weren't like, we knew of each other because Regina is kind of like a village, but we right. weren't like close <laughs> friends or anything like that. Um, but some of us had been talking about some of the different issues related to anti-Black racism and discrimination in various areas. So whether it was school, work, um, you know, professional studies, um, and just like everyday experiences. And then these discussions would kind of happen and we'd talk and like, oh, like, have you seen this? Yeah, I've seen that, that kind of thing. 
and things would die down. And, you know, you go back to your regular life, unfortunately, which is often how these cycles go when things spark up in the media. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So then after that, then I think what had happened was um, there was just a couple of weeks where it was just the nonstop. And I think this was in early June specifically when, um, you know, you saw the incidents with um, George Floyd and the riot. Right all the different things that were happening in the U.S. And I think it was at that time when a lot of people, even locally here, were um, talking about, well, well, what's next? How do we call attention to these issues? Um, and that's kind of around the time where Black and Sask started to, to really formalize itself. Um, from then, um, we started to talk with a bunch of youth in uh, Regina and um, local areas talking about, okay, well, how can we call attention to the stories happening locally? But also, um, I think the main part was also recognizing that, yes, this is happening in the U.S., but how do we like really let the community locally know that these issues are relevant to to Saskatchewan and not because it's happening in the U.S. and all oh, like it sucks for them, but more so these same issues are happening here in their own ways. So I think that was kind of the catalyst for things. And then from there, um, going on to do a bunch of different work in, in advocacy and community development and, and so on. So yeah, that's, that's the organization. Right on. I, uh, I'm curious, uh, was there any idea or thoughts about connecting to other black lives matter movements in Canada? Yeah, for sure. And I think, um, one of the kind of core things as well is that the concept of black lives matter is essentially uh, core to every uh, Black-led organization. <laughs> I think um, the fact that it needs to be stated explicitly is in many ways unfortunate, but also reality yeah. of, of the times that we're living in and just, well, not even just the recent times, but I think over time you recognize that that message is needs to be um, brought forward in many different ways. But I think that um, for a lot of Black organizations, um, just the idea of Black Lives Matter is whether it's said explicitly in the title of the name or not, um, is core to what they do. You can see it through the way that they partner with people, the way they uplift um, different communities, marginalized communities, and diverse Black communities of, of varying like intersectionalities, whether that's related to um, gender identity or um, age and all of everything in between. So yeah. I think that that partnership um, and that kinship is already kind of embedded into Black community. Um, but I think that when it comes to like formally extending ourselves to like black organizations, um, that has happened naturally over um, the course of our organization's existence, which has been awesome. The um, I think I even met um, someone new today and it just continues to happen. Oh, you just right on. To, you know, meet great people. Yeah, I, uh, I seem to recall like uh, back in like I think it was 2016 or 2015, uh, Ferguson riots and, and stuff were going on. And uh uh, the there was not a lot of like or there weren't any black lives matter organizations in saskatchewan at the time <laughs> so i was i i kind of kept my eyes out because i was trying to i was hoping that something would come up and i wasn't sure what to do uh where i could you know s donate my time or my money or whatever but mm -hmm. so it's yeah. good to see more of them around for sure yeah and i think um you know, that visibility of Black organizations is becoming um, more, I think, more important on the public scale um, as people are recognizing um, how ig ignoring particular groups or, you know, only calling upon them for um, tokenistic things um, doesn't really serve anyone when it comes to moving our community as a whole forward. And um, right. like even in 2016, like you're referencing, um, Black organizations are we're alive and thriving, right? Like there's many local organizations in Saskatchewan that have been doing work um, far predating um, any of the recent stories that we're hearing right now. But I think the attention that's given to a lot of them and, um, you know, the attention, which also is tied to the dollars, um, right. needs to only, you know, come with um, some of these tragedies, unfortunately. So I think it's um, being able to see Black organizations in a robust light is definitely one of the, um, I guess, like side side effects of what we've been seeing recently. How has uh, Black and Sask translated some of the momentum that was built up in 2020 into uh, activities or actions in Saskatchewan now? 
For sure. Yeah. Um, so like, like you were kind of mentioning in regards to, well, you know, you see these things happening and then it's like, now what? Um, you know, you you care. It's not like like there's so many. I think that's the thing, too. And we've seen that a lot during the pandemic where it's like you see a constant reel of news um, today. It's something related to, to climate change. Tomorrow it's the economy, um, yeah. you know, like all of these different these different things. And, and people care about them. But I think when it comes to actionable change, um, knowing what steps to take uh, for most people, um, they don't know where, where to start, right? And right. I think that's, you know, there's a number of places you could point to and say, well, it's the school's responsibility, it's parents, it's this and that. <laughs> but um, as an organization, I think one of the things was, well, where do we start? And just picking picking a point and starting to go from there and allowing um, it to be kind of, um, our direction anyways, to also be informed by what communities are telling us that they need and our community specifically. So I think one of the things too, was that um, being able to say that, okay, well, people are asking us about next steps and that sort of thing. And a huge aspect of it comes from awareness and dialogue. Um, so conversations like we're having today, um, were definitely, I think, front of mind for, for a lot of us. So when it comes to then taking action, um, one of the um, core activities that we are able to do is um, education campaigns. Um, so this takes place in different forms. Um, we talk to schools and students um, of different ages, um, talking to them about um, different issues related to anti-Black racism, um, bias, and that sort of thing. And kids are bold, <laughs> you know, when it comes to their questions, yeah. understanding of things. So being able to have those discussions at a young age is great. But then also, I think, um, you know, talking to to elected officials um, and mm -hmm. having those types of discussions as well and holding people accountable has definitely also been part of this education campaign. And then talking to everyday people, um, you know, artists, musicians, um, business owners and such, and having discussions about what their experiences are and making that public so people are able to to learn about their neighbors, I think also does a lot for um, the education aspect too. Have you had any luck with uh, discussing, uh, talking to politicians or represent elected representatives? Yeah, I would say, um, I wouldn't use the word luck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't okay. use the word luck, um, mostly because I think that um, well, number one, the the work that we're doing uh, isn't just starting from nowhere. Um, right. There's, you know, the work of elders in our community and not even just um, in the local like Regina or Saskatchewan community, but even even broader to um, the Black diaspora overall. The work that's been done over over the course of history to allow people like us, young people, um, we're a youth led organization with members um, ranging from well, our executive team anyways, um, ranging from the ages of uh, 19 to 28 and um, above even um, having supports in, in that area. Um, so being able to work with such a diverse group of people has definitely meant that um, we're able to just kind of bring a lot of different perspectives to the table. So mm -hmm. I think when we're talking to um, to politicians and and having those types of conversations, that's one of the, the primary things that we bring up is that we're not the first to bring up these issues. And unfortunately, we won't be the last. Um, yeah. But how are we able to ensure that the issues that we're dealing with today, um, you know, can be mitigated? Those conversations, I think, are are where we come in because the solutions of today may not be relevant, and I hope they're not um, in in years to come because that means that progress is hopefully happening. So I think, yeah, with when it comes to um, to progress, I think we've definitely been fortunate to meet a lot of. Um, people who are willing to have conversations and open to um, to moving the needle forward when it comes to these issues. But I think the one thing um, that I've recognized to be challenging, um, and this is not unique to Saskatchewan or anything like that, but um, is that there are so many, um, you know, areas that I think that that people want to focus on and feeling as though you have to you have to serve a single topic at a time, I think holds right. us back from, from really moving forward as well. Yeah. It's, it's hard to, I guess, address all the things at once, but also some things are, you, you're going to have to focus on more than one thing sometimes. Right. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that too, like it's, well, okay, but um, do, is it one person's responsibility to focus on all the things at once? Not, <laughs> right, not necessarily, right. <laughs> but I think, I think the perspective is also that, um, you know, being able to, to allow um, the groups that are focusing on niche areas um, to do their thing. It's not about one person and being like, Corey, you need to solve racism. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's asking, Nobody's asking. <laughs> right, oh, right, yeah. you know, but more so um, I think providing, um, providing the space for people to come forward with their ideas on how to deal with the issues and um, celebrate the experiences um, that, that they're living, that the, their neighbors are living and provide a quality of life in which they're able to do that um, in a successful way, that's that's the basis of it, right? So I think that is happening in many communities all over the place and people are advocating for, for what they need to be able to live those types of lives. Um, it's I think it's less about asking people for, for handouts or anything like that it, and sure. more so providing people um, you know, the space to be able to say, hey, you have the solutions um, for your community. How do we collaborate to ensure that um, everyone's able to thrive? And and that's exactly, I think, what um, the area uh, that we're, we're really focused on here. That's, I really like that, actually. Like, it, it's sometimes when a person is thinking about what can I do in, in my community, uh, sometimes it gets, you know, you start thinking, well, okay, well, I have to do this and I have to do that. But when there's existing groups already doing things, it's, it's very helpful to be able to say, Hey, can I in fact help you do the thing you're already doing <laughs> rather than be like, Oh, I'm over here and I'm just going to do this thing beside you kind of thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that um, more and more as our communities are starting to realize that um, it's really only us who have got each other. And this is not only, again, specific to the Black community. I think even during the pandemic, we've seen that, um, you know, that reliance on on neighbors, on each other as a community to to do the right things, regardless of what topic you're, <laughs> yeah. you're bringing up there, whatever comes to mind for you. Um, you know, it's, it's so important. It's crucial. Like, there's really nothing that can move forward without... Um, you know, the the support or the buy-in of larger community. So I think um, that ownership of the the reality that we want um, for for Saskatchewan, for our country, um, and even the world at large, if you, you wanted to look at it from that scope, um, it really comes down to a lot of the smaller decisions that are made um, on everyday level. So I think that's why it's really exciting to kind of see, um, you know, the the support that comes from, from people interested in, um, you know, and working, I think, alongside um, us as an organization um, and even just, yeah, having having these types of conversations and, you know, asking questions about what's going on, I think, um, does a lot for um, for improving this condition. So, yeah. So I guess in kind of that vein, like what is going on? What are what is the status of Saskatchewan currently? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, I think, well, as of as of right now, when it comes to what is going on, I think it's a lot of crossroads. Um, I think one of the one of the challenges with that, again, like we've mentioned, is that um, there are so many things coming to light when it comes to um, to racism and discrimination um, that I think in some ways um, a lot of people are seeing it as the reckoning of sorts. Um, mm-hmm. Everything is everything is coming to the surface. Um, you know, light is being shed in a lot of dark areas. Um, and that also means shedding light on longtime corruption and identifying who that's serving. And I think with that comes a lot of uncomfortable conversations. And yeah. I think that in itself is a major, um, a major space that I think um, is either being addressed or isn't in a lot of sectors in the province. And when it is being addressed, Um, In some ways, sometimes you have um, some superficial um, work that's being done and um, superficial in the sense that I think, um, you know, you have some one time conversations or one time um, strategies to to address issues that are kind of meant to be more, um, I guess, well, let's let's try this and see what happens. Um, Mm. Oftentimes, some of the issues with that are things like. Uh, like like poster campaigns where you you know you 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 bring somebody on a team without necessarily thinking about um, what implications that might have in regards to, like supports um, that they might need to be successful. And when things don't work out, it's like, well, we we tried. 
and then you you know you kind of right move on. right <laughs> yeah it's it's uh it's way too easy to give up when you lose momentum yeah no a hundred percent it's definitely way too easy um to give up and I think um even as an organization that's definitely been something that um we've learned from a lot of other groups that are um, that have been doing the work, that continue to do the work alongside us, is that um, creating that capacity to be able to um, to keep things going is definitely not easy. Um, but it's right. so, so worth it, though. Because I think we were even talking about that um, before we, we went live here about, you know, like, how how do you maintain the energy to, to do this kind of work, whether it's um, having conversations, difficult conversations with people that have differing views than you, um, or doing that on a public scale. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I, I, I do this, uh, and you know, it's not a big audience, but it's an audience. Uh, but then like say, like I go to work and I just don't talk about anything at work, <laughs> but, uh, I, I read, uh, I, I read white fragility by, uh, Robin DiAngelo mm. uh, a couple of years ago. And I think that for people such as myself, like the one of the fundamental things that we can do is when somebody says something that's racist, just break with that white solidarity and just be like, yo, man, that is fucked up. Like, you can't say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you know, depending on the setting, might, you know, might want to, you know, like spice that up in, in a way. Or, um, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's interesting, right? Like, I think, um, depending on your level of closeness to people, I think that's often where the largest impact is. Um, even as an organization, it's it's one thing to be, you know, doing like awareness campaigns and, um, you know, sharing um, infographics and that sort of thing as to, um, you know, how to how to um, practice more effective allyship and how to mm -hmm. you know, address racism in the workplace and that sort of thing. Um, but you're right, like it really does come down to these like, um, you know, individual, um, like interpersonal relationships that we have with people, um, which is where the change is really happening um, behind closed doors and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, I guess uh, we could continue going down uh, kind of this vein, but uh, we could also go into counter propaganda if you want. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's... Okay. Um, Yeah, the counter propaganda that we have here is like, isn't racism over or is there no racism in Saskatchewan? Right. Okay. So, <laughs> what do you think? Well, yeah, I don't know. You know what? To, to even, I think, um, just like backtrack like for a second there, when it comes to those, I just like, you know, came like came to my mind in regards to like some of those tough conversations and, and that sort of thing. And I think that um, you know, it's it's really interesting to see how many people are um, are taking a stand, um, but lack uh, the words, um, the words to be able to have some of these tough conversations. And I think often that's that's where we find ourselves um, getting into issues is where, um, you know, you want to say something, but you're not necessarily feeling as though you're well versed enough um, to have some of these conversations. And um, to that, and I guess like in also connecting that to talking about whether racism is over and there is no racism in Saskatchewan. Right. Um, I think the biggest thing often is um, when I'm having these conversations or when I'm, um, you know, posed with that question, oftentimes um, it's easier to get curious about people's experiences. And that's when you start to find out, oh, OK, so based on. Um, you know, perhaps like it's, you know, where you grew up or the the people that you grew up around and that sort of thing. That is why you have the perspective that you have. And not to say that it's an excuse, but oftentimes yeah. when you start to, you know, really have those types of conversations with people, you start to understand a little bit more as to how did you come to this conclusion that um, racism is is over in Saskatchewan, <laughs> right? Because it seems like everybody <laughs> is living in two different Saskatchewans, if that's the case. Well, but this truck driver that I know, he does. He told me that he doesn't get he doesn't get treated differently because of his skin color. So therefore, racism must be over. Right, you know, and, <laughs> and that's the thing, right? And there's so many, and there's different levels, I think, as well. To um, when you're looking at, at racism itself and looking at, okay, well, from from microaggressions and and what's unsaid, 
um, and some of the, the treatment that isn't necessarily um, as direct as what you're you might be seeing on TV or broadcast mm -hmm. in the news. Um, you know, some of these subtle things and also things that are embedded into policy that we're unfortunately just living the, the result of rather than kind of seeing it play out, um, you know, right in front of our eyes. I think that's often as well, um, you know, part of part of the issue, especially with racism in, in Saskatchewan or even um, in Western society is that oftentimes it's not things that you're you're seeing outright. It's it's the little things um, that add up over For time. Sure. For sure. Yeah. 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 I know uh, uh, a lot of people scoff when you talk about microaggressions, mm -hmm. but they're a real thing. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's not like, and like you say, like they add up and, and it affects people in their day-to-day -day lives quite a bit. So, yeah, and it is maybe as well, like, so if anyone's listening and is like, what is this word that these people are throwing around microaggressions? Um, so the concept of microaggressions essentially is just kind of, um, you know, addressing some of these, the slights that happen um, in regards to, to racial bias um, and discrimination. Um, so um, that can be things from um, particular attitudes about how a group of people is expected to behave um, or things that they're they're capable or incapable, um, incapable, sorry, of, of doing. Um, so I think different different ways that that could come out could be um, a lot of comments. I think oftentimes um, is where microaggressions come out is comments about, oh, I never expected, insert <laughs> microaggression <laughs> here. Um, and oftentimes I think for, for myself growing up in Saskatchewan, because um, I don't know if I had mentioned this, but um, born and raised in Saskatchewan. Um, so I've seen things, Corey. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that um, growing up anyways, um, and, you know, growing up, uh, Saskatchewan definitely wasn't as diverse as it is now. And that's saying something. Right. Cause we know that there's um, some Black people who have been here for um, decades and decades uh, prior to me, and they're saying the same thing. So, the, you know, things are things have really been changing a lot. But I found that growing up when it came to microaggressions, it was more so the understanding of this feels like like a bad joke or like a comment right. that like I'm not sure if I'm supposed to laugh or it just feels uncomfortable. Something's off, but not again, like that whole issue of not having the words to describe it. And I think it was yeah. only until like my later teens where I even learned about what microaggressions were and having that term to validate the experiences. And I'm like, Oh, that's, that's what it was all, all this time, you know, like I, I didn't have the language for it. Um, so I think uh, even, yeah. even in that, um, you know, to recognize that things had been happening, things in childhood had been happening and that sort of thing. Um, but when you, you don't have the language to describe it or um, the support to really address it, um, it just kind of happens. And because no, nobody else on the receiving end as well is equipped to necessarily deal with it. Um, these things just continue on and the next generation of youth experience it and perpetuate it and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, uh, I don't want to go into a list of them, but like the thing, as we're talking, things are popping into my head, experiences that I know people have had that like, it's, uh, assumptions that you make about a person, uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, ways of acting towards someone, you know, that, yeah, based on some stereotype that you might not even realize you hold and then you treat somebody differently because of it. So, uh, I, I think <laughs> we can try to do better, I guess, if we learn more, but for sure. No. And I think exactly that, like the learning more part is, is really key because I found that, um, in many of the different presentations we'd have, whether it would be at levels of government, um, school boards and that sort of thing. Um, sometimes you would get comments where it's like, wow, like we, we never would have expected this level of, um, you know, whether it's presentation or, um, commentary or whatever it was, um, from you. <laughs> like, what does that mean <laughs> right and that sort of thing. um so those types of things but then i think at the same time um one of the the best outcomes i think um that i've personally observed of a lot of the work that has been done by um black led organizations in canada especially over recent years um has definitely been that um when we're able to have these conversations and have um people of 
many different backgrounds tuning in and engaging in these conversations is that we're able to recognize that um, we're a lot more similar um, and people say this all the time. It's almost like, you know, to the point where it's a cliche, um, right. we're realizing, right? Like when we're highlighting stories about um, Black entrepreneurs in Saskatchewan talking about, um, you know, the difficulties in getting started and, um, you know, keeping things open and, um, you know, how they've kind of had, well, their experience as a Black person inform some of um, the different things that they've gone through as entrepreneurs. Well, that's relatable to a lot of people, right? And I think at the core of it too, recognizing that um, there's a lot more um, that people could be united on um, when it comes to some of these issues is definitely, I think, um, one of the highlights of having these conversations. And even in addressing like the racism aspect of it, I think when people um, are shielded and look at the race aspect first um, before yeah. like considering the the entire human and how even within like the black community, um, just how diverse we are um, and how many perspectives are at the table. And even when it comes to, the, um, you know, looking at it from more of a left perspective or left leaning or however you'd like to, you know, um, categorize it, um, that doesn't even account for the entire um, right. you know, black, black community in itself. Um, and I may even have people sure. who argue with me on, on that point specifically. So I think, um, even just in that, being able to just recognize um, the diversity uh, within groups and being able to connect with with people and their stories and experiences um, beyond categorizing them into a pre-made box before you get the opportunity to meet them um, doesn't do anyone any good. So being able to connect is just amazing. Yeah, I think like that's one of those, uh, even the, uh, the concept of defunding the police, like that's not, there's not a, a homogenous opinion about that within the black community, right? <laughs> like it's, uh, um, it's something that there, there are, uh, in the U S there are black Trump supporters. There are black conservatives there. You know, it's, I think everybody should be a leftist, but <laughs> that's, Ooh, obviously my bias. Bias. <laughs> that's obviously my bias, but, uh, but yeah, so it's, I think it's super important to recognize that not everybody within a community uh, sees things the same way. Right. Yeah. And I think um, even in that too. So like when we talk about um, that kind of single agenda, um, I guess perspective on um, a lot of black issues, I think that's where a lot of resistance has definitely been met as well when it comes to organizations like um, like Black and Sask and other black led organizations is that um, initially sometimes there can be that perspective that um, because you are seemingly a homogenous group, um, that your goal is domination, total domination right, right. of things and you're you're trying to push your agenda. And and low key, those are some quotes uh from, you know, uh critics, I think, in some of the early days of the work that was being done um in Saskatchewan, but also I think in other places as well, and talking about, well, um, like the Black Lives Matter movement, um, sure. but then also um just organizations that are looking to address anti-Black racism, because I think um, that's also something really important to, to hone in on is that um, Black Lives Matter is just the like part of the foundation of it. When it comes to addressing anti-Black racism and looking at um, some of the other parts of advancing community development, these are things that bleed into all areas of life, not just for, um, for Black people. So I think um, just even in that, like looking at um, like just fo the focus on just the Black Lives Matter part, I think for me anyways as well was definitely just like, okay, yeah, Black Lives Matter, yeah. But like, we have all these other issues, um, like social issues that um, extend, yes, within the Black community, but even beyond that need to be addressed. And I think um, including Black perspectives on it is only going to get us closer to as a society moving forward. But having people recognize, I think that it's just that aspect of it. It's an interesting thing, I think, um, in 30, 40, 60, I don't know how many years it's going to take um, for people to look back on these times. And I wonder what they're going to say about the ways in which <laughs> to racial issues, you know? Well, it all kind of depends if we survive climate change. <laughs> <laughs> I, almost, I almost forgot. I almost forgot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, uh, I think that, that the, uh, the idea, and it scares a lot of white folks, that uh, 
that we will be the minority and that uh, other groups will treat us the way that we have typically treated them. It's a, it's a, I don't know, it's some kind of, it's a fear that so many people have that really, it seems really ingrained and really raises their hackles when, whenever anti-racism is discussed in any way. Yeah, no, I, I definitely um, get that sense, I think, in a lot of um, leadership circles, I would say, is that that um, resistance to having um, power be shared is definitely alive and well. <laughs> yeah, well, for sure. And I think, um, you know, when it comes to, to that fear of the unknown, though, um, that's another thing where we can say that that's not a new concept. Um, right. Being, you know, being afraid of, um, of those possibilities and such. But I think the accountability piece as well is also very important. Like you spoke about, um, like, you know, the white concept of white fragility and such um, a little bit mm -hmm. beforehand. And I think even in that sense as well, um, being able to, to move beyond the point of, of shame and apologies, because I think um, a big aspect of uh, what was noticed um, on the personal level um, in like 2020 and when a lot of these um, issues were being raised is, um, you know, that somewhat, I, I'm not sure where it exactly originated, but um, call to action in regards to um, just apologies being made. And that, I think you can, you can see that over in like a bunch of other groups as well, where it's just the constant reel of of apologies um, that just blanket everything. Like I'm, I'm just, yeah. I'm just sorry. Like I'm just With nev sorry. never follows any action. There's never anything done about it. It's always, always apologies and guilt. Yeah. And that, and that guilt, who does that serve um, particularly? Because I think a big aspect of that is that the guilt takes up a lot of time. And mm -hmm. what we're seeing is that we, we don't have time. People, people are dying, you know, people are um, not even just um, yeah. in regards to outright like police brutality and like um, issues of, of that nature and um, just like violence in general, but um, even from just like systemic barriers, you know, um, that are preventing people to be able to, um, again, like achieve some of their, their goals that would improve their livelihoods and, and that of their, their families and their communities. So I think that um, when it comes to, to that guilt and um, people having conversations to be able to, to address that, that is where um, the work starts. Because I think when it comes to, um, to well, young people and um, driven people of all backgrounds and all ages um, being ready to do the work, um, mm. they're there. It's more so, well, we're here, you know, even as an organization, um, we're ready to ready to do the work and committed to to making those building those relationships um, to be able to to move things forward. I think it's just that are are people ready to do the work individually within themselves to be able to meet communities where they're at? It's a tough question. I'm I'm a little pessimistic, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I uh, I get I, I mentioned that uh, I work in the oil field. Uh, but, and on a daily basis, I see people, uh, who are using like, like casually, uh, racial slurs, uh, ableist slurs, uh, 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 homophobic slurs. Like it's just part of the fabric of their daily lives and attitudes that go along with those things, right? Like that, that continue to go on unexamined in any sense. And then when it's brought up, there's defensiveness and there's that fragility and, it's, it, it doesn't fill me with hope for the future. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think that's, it's interesting because it's, well, when you're met with that defensiveness, um, I think for a lot of people and myself included in any situation in which, you know, like you're, you're growing up and you're learning about what it means to, um, to be reflective of yourself and, you know, aware of, of what you're doing and saying. And if you've ever been called out on, on anything of any scale, um, well, oftentimes it's, well, well, was I really doing that? Like, is that, is that how it was? And like, you, you know, you're, you're yeah. questioning, like you're trying to understand what was, what was happening and stuff. But I think when you, when you get to that crossroads of, okay, well, you can take the next step as to um, taking those actionable steps to recognize, okay, well, where do I move forward from here? Um, and digging deeper within yourself to understand like, well, what does that say about if this is what I'm putting out into the world, what does that say about, about me and about, you know, like my, my community right. and that type of thing. And examining that takes work. 
it, yeah. like, it, there's no way to get around yeah. that. I think that's, that's the part, right. Where it's like, it takes, it takes work and it's, it's messy. Oftentimes it's very messy because it can reveal a lot of truths about yourself and your community that you may not be ready to confront because oftentimes sure. the answers are bigger than just you. Um, but it's necessary work. Yeah, for sure. And I, I often, I, I try to be an empathetic person when it comes to even people who are expressing bad attitudes, because uh, just in my own personal journey, I noticed that when people were, when I had a safe place to examine myself, that's when I improved better. Mm -hmm. So, but also, uh, I mean, obviously uh, I don't want to, I don't want to say that this is the responsibility of anybody who is experiencing oppression. And this is some, like, this is a job for someone like myself who uh, I, I know these guys or whatever that are expressing these views. I can call them out on it, perhaps gently, perhaps not. And, and, maybe we can have a discussion about why what they said or believe is wrong in, in such a way that they don't get, you know, that defensive attitude or, around it. But again, so it, it just depends on the situation sometimes too. No, for sure. And I think um, when it comes to um, expanding your energy um, to deal with, with these issues, I think that's also part of, um, you know, the aspect in which with our organization, um, it's so amazing to be surrounded by, um, youth who are involved in so many different activities because not all of a single person or organization's energy can be focused on on tragedy and trying to convince yeah. someone of your humanity um because when for i sure. tell you it, it was draining for people all over different backgrounds who were involved in this type of work whether it's um you know dei work um or working um diversity equity and inclusion type of work or um, anti-black racism and discrimination, anybody who's involved in any type of work where you're trying to convince um, people that you you matter too, and mm. you, you want to be part of, you know, of mainstream society. Well, not necessarily mainstream, because we're trying to, we're trying to be better than mainstream. <laughs> yeah, um, want to improve mainstream society. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> like the standard of mainstream, you know, needs to be raised in that sense. But I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's not easy work. Um, so being able to take the time to as well, I think, um, celebrate uh, the amazing contributions of, of Black people um, in various sectors and just even talk about um, ordinary life things. Like what is mm -hmm. what was it like, um, like talking to um, some of the people who had grown up in in Saskatchewan, like in, in the 60s, in the 50s, like talking to, to them about their experiences and just hearing about those everyday types of things i think in just the celebration of just being simply alive which is something to celebrate in 2021 <laughs> um you know i think just even in that itself there's so much learning that comes from from truly just listening to the people around you and it's unlikely that some of you know your um co-workers may ever you know like um pick up certain certain books um and like um when it comes to um you know like looking at like heavy theory about like um, anti-black racism and that sort of thing. And right. it's not even, it's not for everyone, right. In terms of that delivery method. But I think, in, sure. you know, in having those conversations um, with, with people one-on-one -on -one and being able to engage just about like, Hey, you, you grew up and you had um, a mom that, that burnt the beans. Me too. You know what I mean? And like <laughs> letting the com conversations, I think, grow from, grow from there to talk about um, some of the real barriers that are impacting people. Um, is is where things start at that level um and then also being able to then open your eyes to um to some of the things that are happening um when it comes to to policy and and voting in the direction that you you wish the world to um to go to and putting yourself out there to actively you know be involved in um in the work that's going on is important as well yeah it's too bad you can't uh, <laughs> i i think of like the books that i've read that have helped me <laughs> learn about stuff and i it would be nice if we could just stick a book in somebody's hand and be like here, read this and learn. Right. Yeah. Wow. And it's, it's really something to think about. Well, what is, what is that single moment um, that would get someone to, well, whether it's change their ways or expand their, their mindset um, in the world. And I feel like 
for many people, they have like um, whether it's a, a moment or a set of experiences that they can turn to when it comes to this. Um, but for myself, I can definitely say that on on any issue that um, I feel like I was less informed about um, at the start before moving forward, um, the best thing was always just keeping the open mind and focusing on mm -hmm. um, on the, the connection to humanity, I think, um, was definitely the driving force and being able to not even necessarily empathize. I think that's the base level, um, but being able to recognize that that everything is connected, not even at the point where, oh, this affects me too, so I should care, but it affects it affects someone. And, and I think that that in itself um, should be enough of a starting point um, for, for us to be able to, um, to join forces when it comes to addressing a lot of the issues we're seeing in our community. Right. Yeah. And I think as well, it's interesting how sometimes um, some of those theories as to how the world is can become self-fulfilling prophecy in regards yeah. to like, you know, you'll get individuals who see it as well. There will, um, that's how society is. There will always be like in, in over the course of history, like there will always be someone on top. There's many people right. who, who hold that view that, well, today it's so-and-so, tomorrow it's these people. And as, as the world goes on, it will just continue to be, to be that cycle. Um, and I, you know, I think not that um, that hasn't been, you, you know, you can't point to that as being the case in certain situations. Um, but I think that um, us challenging ourselves to do better, um, whether it's mm -hmm. like, you know, you can't you can't control the entire outcome of society or humanity. Um, but in our communities, I think it's the pursuit of better, um, which is what defines uh, the point that we're at right now. Um, are, are we committed to, to doing the work to continuously be better, whether it's on like a personal scale or like looking at the larger community? I think that's that's what sets apart, um, you know, different points of history from each other. And I, 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 I don't know, maybe it's not entirely accurate, but I like the idea that improving the individual also improves the collective, right? Like if I am doing better, then I'm improving the people around me. And if somebody else is doing better than they're improving the people around them. And that's one of the ways that we can improve our society. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. And I think that um, with our group, that's definitely the direction um, when we've just been able to connect as like a ragtag team of, team of kids, if you want to call it that, um, you know, focused on, on starting, um, starting to move things forward and not just, um, you know, talk about it, but see what we could do to take, um, to take action in the direction where we wanted to see our community go to and knowing that um, there is support behind us and um, there would be people who would definitely have their opinions. But at the end of the day, um, it's not enough to to complain or just like talk about issues without trying to, um, you know, to work towards something better or bring ideas forward. Um, so I think even in that, we've been able to connect, um, like I had mentioned before, with just like so many um, amazing comrades. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that was slick, hey? Um, but yeah, to be able to connect with just so many amazing, amazing people along the way who have been able to lend um, their expertise, whether um, it's in navigating just like, um, you know, uh, the political landscape and and how to, to connect with people um, who are ele elected officials, um, mm -hmm. but then also just when it comes to even um, informing us about different things that are going on, there's, um, you know, housing crisis that's happening, um, opioid um, and such. There's so many different things that are happening every day and being able to um, be aware of them and be able to support, again, like the work that's happening um, all at the same time, because all these issues, again, are all <laughs> simultaneously yeah. um, being able to to be informed and to lend support um, as, as it kind of, um, comes up or as you become aware of it, I think is, um, you know, really important for us taking steps in the right direction. So it's, it's been great. Ah, we, we were going to do a foes and comrades, but, uh, we didn't have an, uh, a foe decided on. So yeah, what are I, we would, thinking? <laughs> I would say that, you know, when it comes to when it comes to foes and I guess maybe one thing to um, if you wanted to just go into a little bit more as to um, like when you categorize foes from your perspective, how do you how do you see that is what I'd like to know as well. Well, from my perspective, it's people who are intentional, well, who seem intentionally uh, standing in the way of any kind of progress. Um, when uh, if I were to say. Uh, 
uh, is somebody standing in the way of scientific progress or, or defeating the, uh, the virus per se, then I would say maybe there are some uh, systemic issues as well as uh, individual responsibility that is at play there. Uh, like anti-vaxxers might be a foe if one was talking about COVID. For sure. Yeah. No, thank you for, yeah, um, you know, clarifying that. And I think that when it comes to the foes, um, you know, from from that perspective, then I would definitely say that there's kind of two aspects to it. So one being, as we've kind of been speaking about here, which is um, maybe the unaware individual. Um, mm-hmm. So like when talking about just like, you know, characteristics, it's um, you, you're not even uh, realizing the impact that you're having in regards to dissenting the development of those around you just due to your own lack of, of self-awareness. And I think that in itself poses a lot of harm um, inflicted on people. And I think when individuals look back and, um, you know, this can happen in lots of different situations. When you look back and you recognize that someone didn't even rec- like realize for themselves the impact that their lack of awareness had on you. And they didn't even, you know, they could say something and years later they have no recollection of it. But for you, it was this one pivotal moment. I think Mm -hmm. um, that lack of awareness is definitely like, you know, check, check yourself and examine, examine (laughs) your, your faux like tendencies for sure. Um, Cause we, we can all have them. I think that's the thing. No one is above, um, you know, making mistakes or, um, you know, uh, being, being a foe in someone else's story. But I think it's, again, the, the pursuit of better, which is, which is what, um, distinguishes us essentially from, um, from just being like stumps on a log. Like we can, we can grow and change. No one is, um, is stuck in, in being in whatever, um, condition that they were found regardless of their circumstances. So I think, for sure. I think that's one, one aspect of foeship. It makes me think of, uh, like, it was a few, it was quite a few years ago now, but I would, I would have placed myself in the faux category in regards to, uh, ageism, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, I really thought that I was smarter than young people. I really thought that I, they didn't know anything. They hadn't experienced the world, despite the fact that actually I hadn't experienced as much as I thought I had. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, but I've grown past that as, yeah. as one does if you, uh, encounter someone who can confront you for sure yeah and i think that happens even at the youth level as well right and i mean like that seems quite obvious where it's like oh these young people they think they know everything type of thing um but i think you know one of the cool things as well uh, of being part of black and sask has definitely been just like the the intergenerational nature of it and yes like youth led um but i think as well like um, ancestral and like uh, the wisdom of the elders in our community has definitely been a driving force to the work that we're able to do, um, be able to tap into um, the inroads that have, have been made um, by um, community leaders and not even just in Saskatchewan, but beyond um, has definitely done a lot for us. So I think, um, you know, definitely like shout out to, to all of the, the community leaders who are doing their thing, because I think with, without them, we wouldn't have the footing to be able to to begin a lot of the work um, that we're able to do just a little bit more um, easily because of that. Um, but then, yeah, I think that um, as well, when it comes to when it comes to foes on like the larger scale as well, I think it's oftentimes um, looking at the motives of, of groups um, and sectors. So, um, for example, when um, you know economics are, are placed over um, the well-beings of individuals, um, and it's easier said in, in that sense than looking at actual dollar amounts. But I think when when we reduce the quality of, of life to people to to making these small changes and it's a signature here and a signature there, and you're not yeah. looking at, you know, you're not looking at the circumstances, the faces that are necessarily associated with the decisions that are being made. I think in in that sense as well, um, those full like tendencies come come back because <laughs> I think the further you get you get into that, um, you start to recognize and I think even as an organization, you recognize that um, there's so many individuals that are almost like cogs in this larger machine um, mm-hmm. where oftentimes it's like your your hands are tied. You're, there's only so much you can do and it has to shuffle off to the next, you know, the next group or the next um, uh, department or such and such. So I think that in that sense where that accountability comes into um, into play might often as well be recognizing the role that you're you're playing in the larger system. And right. I think that's such a large question as well. Cause then it's like, well, do I not, do I quit my job because I'm part of, <laughs> right, part of right. this, 
you know, part of the system. It's, it's, but you still got to survive in the system. So somehow you got to balance that, right? Exactly. And that's, I think that's, you know, where we come back to that whole thing of it's so much larger than just um, an issue on, on race. It's a symptom of, of a much larger, um, much larger social conditions that I think we're all, we're all dealing with. Um, it's just unfortunate that in many ways, um, it just becomes an added layer on onto mm-hmm. so many things that we're unable to see past the distractions of, of racial tensions and such and be able to address the real issues as to why, who is benefiting from, from all of this, you know, and be able to talk right. about those conversations. It's a podcast for another day. <laughs> I do lots of those ones too. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, I've checked some of them out. So I, I know, I know that you have those conversations, and it's amazing. I think that um, more and more, I, as we open our eyes to that, um, I hope, I hope uh, better things come from from that uh, increased awareness for sure. Yeah, I, it makes me think actually, because I actually thought for a moment at the start of COVID that the powers that be would realize that they need to take care of their people and keep us alive so that we could at least, even, even if the power and money step stayed up at the top, they would still need to keep us alive in order to facilitate that, to serve their interests. Right. But they've, they've shown they don't care. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and that's where, and that's where it comes back to, you know, like um, the amazing, I guess, work and contributions. And unfortunately at, at um, some small scales, but I think increasingly, right? Like people are recognizing like um, mutual aid and the importance of of taking sure. care of, of those around you and, and doing that work is just um, ever ever more important um, when when recognizing that at, at any point what what we consider to be privileges um, in in some ways and other ways um, some people consider them rights um, could be taken away at a drop of a hat or inaccessible to people whether it's yeah. um, access to healthcare and beyond um, and there's already barriers for for so many people um, including the black community in terms of accessing certain things in that regard um, so being able to I think recognize just um, how fragile things are as as currently stated is just an increased I think creates an increased drive um, to want to improve things for the better. Yeah, for sure. I I mean, obviously the United States seems like it's on a much faster curve towards collapse than we are, but <laughs> but that doesn't mean that our society is built on a stable ground the way it is right now, right? No, and I think that um, and that's the thing as well. Um, Oftentimes when we when we point fingers or not even necessarily point fingers, but even just for comparison's sake as well, right? Um, to be able to um to mark um how how well are we doing by by global standards in comparison to to our neighbors or um or other groups and um other countries and such. Um being able to I think uh learn and have more conversations about um what what people are doing well and how things are actually working in in the favor of um, of different communities and such um, would serve us a lot a lot better, I believe. Um, yeah. yeah, being able to um, to focus on on that beyond, and I think that even is what impacts a lot of perspectives on anti black racism as well as um, being able to look at um, what's happening in other countries and then deflect yeah. it. And say, you know, well, um, they're doing that, so so we must be okay by comparison when. Again, what is the standard that we're we're basing um, well being on, and yeah. and where did it come from? I think, and and who who started those ideas? Um, these are all important conversations to be had as well. Yeah, for sure. Like uh, it kind of speaks to the one point in your uh, in the counter propaganda about isn't racism over, or there's no racism in Saskatchewan because a lot of times you'll get people saying, well, there's no ra- there's no anti black racism in Canada. Mm-hmm. Look what's going on down in the U.S. And but that bar is so low, like we have to acknowledge our own accountability and our own problems. Exactly. Yeah. And like there's and there's so many amazing scholars who are, um, you know, putting out um, really interesting work around this. Um, Rob Mater being one of the leaders on that with Policing Black Lives and such and and many yeah. others. who, Yeah. And many others who are, you know, um, having those conversations at the local level. So I think. Um, when it comes to isn't racism over, there's no like, you know, there's no anti-black racism. I think um, 
it's wishful thinking in, in many ways um, to, to be able, and it's a privilege to be able to, um, to dismiss um, the experiences of, of marginalized groups um, at, at that level. It's such like a, such right. a profound statement um, to make. Um, but the work continues onwards. I think, um, you know, for the communities that are able to, and the individuals who are able to stand alongside um, marginalized groups as we kind of um, forge forward and and build relationships, I think as well, um, not basing things in fear and being brave enough to, to have conversations, to reach out to, to strangers on the internet um, and, <laughs> you know, and, and ask um, questions and talk about uncomfortable um, topics. I think, um, you know, it's, it's happening. It's happening regardless of uh, whether or not um, people who are scared are are ready for it. And mm-hmm. it's exciting to see the, the support for that as well. So it's, um, you know, in 2022, there are a lot more things um, coming um, with Black and Sask as well. So we're really excited to nice. be able to, um, even with, I think, hopefully fingers fingers crossed and, you know, wood knocked and everything, um, be able to extend outreach into the community um, further. Um, we're really looking forward to being able to, to connect with with more people of, of all backgrounds as well. So, yeah. Right on. Um, so I guess, how can people connect with you and uh, support your work? For sure. Yeah. Um, so you can reach out to us um, on uh, social media. So on Instagram, um, Facebook at Black and Sask. Um, we're also on LinkedIn for anyone who's interested in learning a little bit um, more about some of the intricacies of um, some of the work that we do. Um, we put some more details out on there as well. Um, you can also check us out on uh, blackandsass.org on our website. Um, we're in the process of continuously um, updating that. So there will be a lot more materials on there for people to, to read and engage with. Um, so we're really excited to share on there as well. Um, and for inquiries, um, to reach out to us and, and um, talk about potential collaborations and ways to connect further, um, you can also email us at info at blackandsask.com. And we'd love to have conversations with um, with people and talk about um, how we can start to address a lot of these issues and how we can start to um, build relationships um, with you, your institutions um, and businesses. So really look forward to, um, to meeting um, listeners and community members and um, yeah, continue the work. Right on. I, uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump the queue for this one and I'm going to get this out as fast as I can. Uh, ahead of some previously recorded stuff. So uh, do you have any uh, events or things going on within the next uh, couple months that you want to tell people about? Um, I would say um, just because there is Black History Month coming up in February 2022, I would say the best thing you can do is watch our spaces because we do have a lot of exciting collaborations um, that we are in the process of getting ready to release. Um, So news about that will be launched um, in a very grand way um, happening very soon. So um, I would uh, yeah, definitely invite um, all of our community members um, to definitely just uh, stay tuned on our pages um, because we're going to be releasing more information about that coming soon. Right on. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a re- and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or ratemypodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist, Humanist, Leftist, Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking 
and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves. Sorry about the banging, my daughters. <laughs> oh, no problem. I, I was just like, I thought there was applause coming from somewhere. I was like, this is <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what else we got here?